Hello. Our story begins with Naboo. It was dark and eerily silent. Padme was wandering through the empty city streets. She was looking for someone, but who she was looking for, she didn't know. A man came up to her. It looked like Bail Organa, but he had the voice of her friend Obi-Wan Kenobi. He told her that Anakin was gone. She asked what he meant. The man told her that he perished over an axes. Padme turned her head and said that couldn't be true, until another man came up and told her that he died at Ringo Vinda. Another person told her that there were rumors that he was captured by Dooku at Ba's Pity. Finally, she saw a little green life form who told her that Skywalker died on the planet of Kato Nemodia. Ahsoka couldn't save him and he crashed into the side of a mountain. Padme was so confused and she pushed past the people and continued. She ran from street to street and then the street was quieter. She felt the chill roll down her spine. She looked forward and saw a pathway. The city around her vanished and she was far away from Theed. All she saw was a beautiful little pathway. It looked like something that would lead to a garden of sorts or maybe just a tiny building. She continued and stopped. Her eyes drifted from left to right. Weeping willows surrounded her, and it looked like fireflies were filling the air. It was so elegant, and then her eyes laid sight on a couple of words that almost paralyzed her. They read, Here lies Padme Amidala, former queen of the Naboo. The shock almost lifted her from her feet, but she carried forward. It's not every day you get to see your own tomb. Padme stepped up to the door and opened it. She looked in and saw a figure kneeling at the grave. Darkness covered the figure's back, and a large flowing cape floated down to the ground. The sound of the door opening got the attention of the shadow. On the ground, Padme noticed a skull-like mask. It looked like the anatomy of just about any human, but there was a metallic eeriness to it. When the figure turned around, she saw what looked to be Anakin's face. It was covered in scarring, and there was a distasteful paleness about it. She looked and found the scar that covered one of his eyes. It was Anakin, but his eyes were yellow. The figure turned around with great haste upon realizing he had been discovered, and stood up with such force it left craters in the ground from the metallic boots. The man's arm reached out and Padme was lifted from her feet. The man, the machine, the person she thought she knew vanished, and the skeleton's helmet looked into her eyes and she felt a chill roll down her spine, with the echo of breathing before she jumped up in her bed. Her breath was heavy as she searched her room. The blinds were down and her chest moved up and down at such speeds you'd think she just finished a marathon. Her heart rate started at nearly 200 and she was short on air. Sweat covered her entire body and drowsiness filled her mind. Her hands patted the surface of the bed to ensure she knew where she was. What did she just see? What just happened? Is that Anakin? Was he safe? Was he alright? Padme leapt off the bed, her legs shaking and her eyes drifted from all corners of the room. She couldn't see it, but her eyes were bloodshot. The speed at which she rose from her slumber should have popped a blood vessel in her eyes. The terror she felt in such a short moment couldn't be put to words. It all felt so real, and yet she had to pass it off as just a normal nightmare. Padme walked over to the window to open the blinds. She had a busy day ahead of her. That is until the building she was in was rocked. That was odd. Maybe they were doing construction. When she opened the window, she was completely caught off guard by what she saw. The entire city was under attack. The CIS had invaded the planet, and they were gunning for the capital. If they won, then surely the war would be lost. All of this conflict felt so unnecessary, and now the pinnacle of power in the galaxy was under assault. Though truthfully, she slept through worst parts of the battle. Her residence was far from the Senate building, which is where the Separatists were attacking. Padme's guard ran into inform her that the Chancellor had been abducted. They for the most part locked down the building, but the droid forces, aside from a few stray fighters, got to this part of the city though they were dealt with by such pilots as Stacey Tin and Mace Windu. The ground battle was a victory for the most part. The guard then informed the senator that they were taking her with them to the lower parts of the building just in case a second wave came to the surface. A second wave never came. Instead, the Republic claimed victory over the planet and the Invisible Hand crashed down on a landing strip, killing a couple dozen people when it knocked out the air traffic control center. A number of hours later, after the battle, the Senators would be allowed to return to the Republic Executive Building, where they converged to find that Palpatine had been rescued, and on top of that, Skywalker hadn't died. Padme was very relieved. Of course, the dream was a reflection of her own reality. She'd heard rumors a number of times that Anakin had been killed in combat. The stories she heard and the rumors only led to nightmares and daydreams when she would zone out her desk, imagining the worst. It turns out the dream world is a reflection of the reality in some way, shape, or form. Padme never thought about it or realized this until the war. With so many nightmares about Anakin dying, she didn't want to imagine the possibility of them being real. But he was here, right in front of her. And after a short embrace, she told him what she had heard, and he told her that it wasn't of worry. At this point, they weren't really hiding their relationship, canoodling in public and such. But Padme did have news for Anakin, that she was pregnant. What a turn of events. This changed the entire dynamic of everything. But it would be alright. Everything would work out in their favor. 
This was in accordance to what Anakin thought. Padme was definitely, and rightly so, worried about the prospects of that. They had to split up for some time during the day, but that night, they'd be able to join each other at Padme's residence, where they would at least have the luxury of spending time together in privacy. They would spend the entire time catching up and talking about what each of them had gone through since the last time they saw each other. It had been months at the very least. When the two of them went to bed, they each were given a number of struggles in their dreams. Anakin had nightmares put into his head by Palpatine. However, being that the Force works as it does, considering it brought Anakin to life because of Plagueis, it would play the same trick on Palpatine. The Force used Palpatine's motivations to sway the balance of the universe back into place. What Palpatine was doing was essentially cheating. Anakin's free will as an individual would likely stay where he needed to be without the nightmares. However, with them, it offset everything. So while Anakin was having nightmares about his wife dying in childbirth, Padme was gifted dreams about Anakin becoming Darth Vader. By comparison, Anakin's dreams were very tame. What Padme experienced was pure terror. She found herself in a small village. There were people all about happily. It was daytime. That is, until she heard the breathing. The day fractured into a desolate darkness. All the people that were walking around helplessly lay on the ground, dead. Their bodies torn apart, faces disjointed, limbs were facing ways that limbs shouldn't face, and children were ripped from their families. It didn't even look like there was a fighting chance for any of them. It seemed like everything was done as a result of enjoyment, like whoever did this enjoyed tearing people apart. Padme ran over and looked at the bodies. Everything felt cold. She heard the breathing again, and she turned around and saw a red lightsaber being held by the same dark figure from the previous dream. She yelled out to Manny to know why he did it. The figure turned around and looked at her. The lightsaber fell to the ground, and it stepped forward and told her that he needed help. Padme asked why she should help him, and he told her that they were married. Padme spoke back, telling him that she didn't believe him. Anakin could, could never be so vile. The hands of the metallic figure reached up to the helmet and released a puff of air. Unlike the previous dream where she couldn't tell, well, really tell, when the helmet was taken off, it looked just like Anakin this time. There was no burn scars and his skin wasn't deathly pale. His eyes were still blue and he looked over at her with pain in his eyes. She asked what happened. He told her he couldn't say. All he could do was ask for her help. He didn't want to keep doing this. Padme asked what he meant by that, and Anakin told her that he didn't want to keep murdering helpless people to fill a void that sat in his own heart. Padme got up from the ground and asked where it started. Anakin shamefully looked away and said his mother's death. He told her that he didn't want it to become reality. When Padme jolted from her sleep, she wasn't as deathly afraid as she was last time. But something was off. Her eyes paced around the room, and she found that Anakin had left, so she got up to see where he was. When she walked to the edge of her room, she saw a silhouette in the hallway and nearly fell off her feet. All this stress surely couldn't be good for the pregnancy. She looked down the hallway and thought she saw the same silhouette from the dream. He looked like the same thing. If that wasn't a wake-up call, she didn't know what was, so she pinched her shoulder to make sure she wasn't imagining what she just saw. In her mind, she paused. She wanted to make sure she was sound before she went forward. As she moved forward, she got Anakin's attention by dimly lighting the room. She asked if he was alright, and he told her that he had a nightmare, similar to the one he had about his mother just before she died. However, this time the dream involved Padme. She asked what had happened, and he told her all the simplicities of it. She died in childbirth, and he didn't know what happened to the child. Padme suggested that it'd be alright, but asked if he was doing okay, because she had a nightmare too. Anakin asked what she meant. She asked Anakin again to tell her how he was feeling. If the war made him feel like a different person, or if he altogether felt like he'd changed because of it. Anakin was a little confused and asked where this was coming from, and so she sat down and looked up at him. She felt like for a moment she was inside the same dream. She asked Anakin what he felt when he killed the Tuscans three years before. The reason she was inclined was because of the Anakin that just mentioned the dreams he had of his mother, and the Anakin that was in the dream mentioning his mother. If Anakin had dreams about his mother, and had no issue slaughtering a bunch of nomads in the desert, then what would stop him from doing the same? this time. The reality of the situation is that Padme accepted that she wasn't a martyr, however, if she died in childbirth, she didn't want people to suffer for it. She was in public service, the entire point of her job was to help people and ensure they got treated better in some way, shape, or form. During her early political life, she helped a number of people on a dying planet and they all eventually died. She told the story to Anakin years before, and yet now she feared the possibility of her death affecting others. Padme's maternal instinct kicked in with this, as she felt that if her child lived and she died, she'd be okay with that. She wouldn't be okay if her death was responsible for the deaths of people elsewhere. Anakin looked at her and thought for a moment. It was a weird question, but he told her in the moment that he felt better about it, and afterwards he felt a bit of shame. He then asked her why she asked him that question. Padme looked at him and told him that she'd been having nightmares, at least for the past two nights. They were accompanied by Anakin, but not the person she fell in love with. Rather, it was someone she didn't know anymore, and 
She said that that version of him didn't say anything except for one thing. He asked her to help him. He didn't want to keep doing it. Anakin asked what it was, and he felt coldness drift through the air. Chills rolled down his back before she said anything. She looked up and told him that he slaughtered a village of people. Families ripped apart, and he held a red lightsaber. In the dream, he told her that he didn't want to do it anymore, but he couldn't stop. Anakin looked at his wife in terror. She couldn't use the Force, but she was afraid of him, or it was simply the Force working through her to convey a message to Anakin. It didn't make sense. A tear sat in her eye, and he came over to her. She told Anakin that she was taking his concerns seriously, but didn't want him to do something rash if anything happened to her. He asked what she meant, and she held his hand as they sat as close as two beings could to each other. She told him that she didn't want him to hurt anyone because of something out of his control, especially if it was a result of her pain, death, suffering, or whatnot. She told Anakin that it would only break her heart more. Sure, Padme didn't believe Anakin was a bad man, or that he would hurt a fly, but the fear of him hurting others was all too real at this point. Could he kill kids or rip families apart? In her mind, no. But people can change, and free will can be a nasty curse to an unsuspecting individual. Anakin held her hand tighter, and he told her that he would never do anything as such. She looked at him in the eyes and asked that he promise, promise to not do it no matter what. He looked at her. His heart jumped a little, but he accepted the promise. When the next day came, Anakin would have a conversation with the Grand Master of the Jedi Order about his dreams. Anakin did make a promise, but he couldn't help but see if anything could change the future. And Yoda simply told Anakin that he needed to train himself to let go. It was a genuine message and one that kind of played off the promise he made to his wife. Yoda's suggestion of letting go allowed Anakin to see that maybe he should actually just let events play out before he acted on them, though he was unsure. However, what Yoda said about sensing the future reminded him of the dream that Padme had. It was a little funky, him using a red lightsaber and slaughtering people. It's not that Padme suggested they were Tusken Raiders, they were just people that he just slaughtered, people of a random village. Could he actually really do that? In his mind, he didn't believe so, but part of him feared the idea that he could. He had no issue doing it to the Tusken Raiders. After his meeting with Yoda, he went back to his room and thought about it. He then called Padme's personal communicator, but she didn't pick up. Fair enough, she was working inside the Senate. In the coming hours, Anakin would be entrusted with spying on the Supreme Chancellor, a goal that he wasn't exactly fond of. The actions of the Council were furthering him from the Order, but at the very least when he was told that he didn't have the rank of Master, he didn't throw a hissy fit inside the Council Chambers. He was just trying to practice what Padme had said, and even what Yoda had said. The Council brought him into their ranks as a high honor, and to do so without the rank of Master was also a high honor, at least from their perspective. Anakin's practicing of letting go was really difficult. He wanted to try and throw it back into the Council members' faces, but he decided not to at the last second. Something about the dream Padme told him about was really etching away at him. The way he just seemingly killed a village of people without provocation kind of worried him. The way it was described, it seemed like it was something that came out of nowhere, like he was doing it to fill a hole in his heart. So when he looked at Windu and the other council members after he was told he wasn't a master, he pictured himself surrounded by their dead bodies. He didn't want that. He may have not agreed with them, but disagreeing with others didn't warrant their dead bodies strewn about a room. When Anakin sat down in his seat for the first time, he thought about how different that could have been if he had gone against the council on their decision. Everyone was already on edge. Mundi, Deppa, and Plo were already on different battlefronts, and many other masters were about to be dispatched elsewhere in the galaxy. As the session continued, Anakin's mind went into dreams from the previous night. The conflict that arose in his heart left him confused to say the least. Of course, after the session, he learned about his new mission to spy on the Chancellor, and after a small discussion with Obi-Wan on the matter, he returned to Padme's residence. He had to wait for a little while until she got back from the Republic Executive Building. When she returned, she noticed how bent out of shape he was. When she asked Anakin what was wrong, he he told her that he didn't know what to think. He wasn't positive on how to feel about the Jedi anymore, but the same went for just about everything. She asked what he meant. He told her that Yoda suggested he learn to let go. He expressed his discomfort with how he was portrayed in her dream. He suggested a lack of trust in the Jedi. Most of what he was doing was alluding to deeper messages, but he wasn't telling the full truth, which was inevitably creating a divide in the relationship. Communication without expression or even a lack of communication divides a sturdy base and deepens a chasm in an unstable base. She asked that he come out clean and he tried to shut her out, but she asked again that he be up front with her. This game of cat and mouse wasn't healthy for their relationship, especially not if they were soon to be parents. They needed to have an open pathway to trust, and if they kept avoiding it, then they would destroy themselves. She stood up and followed Anakin to where he was standing, and she guided him back to the sofa and they sat down. Anakin 
finally opened up, slowly, one word at a time. Opening up was never easy, it wasn't meant to be, but getting things off his chest was better than shoving them down and allowing them to overtake him. He told her about the mission statement from the Jedi Council and what he was being asked to do. The next thing he told her was about the entire conversation he had with Yoda in the early parts of the morning. Finally, he expressed his unhappiness with how she was seeing him in her dreams. It wasn't that he was upset at her, but more so himself. In reality, it made him fear himself and what he could become. If he was capable of scaring her like that, then could he truly become that monster? Padme was very steadfast as an individual, someone who didn't take crap from anyone, so the notion that she was genuinely afraid of this persona made Anakin realize the depths of which he had gone. Their conversation was very hard, but to open up with each other and be honest allowed for growth in their shaky relationship. This was especially necessary after the separation because of the war and the Clovis incident that almost caused a flat out divorce. By the time the conversation was over, Anakin was requested the Opera House to join the Chancellor. He told Padme and she said he should go. As he left, she went to lay down, which ended up causing her to go back to sleep. The first two dreams were bad, but this dream would be the worst out of the three of them. The previous two dreams highlighted negative traits of a future she could never predict. This dream, on the other hand, told her exactly who her husband could become. The irony of this dream is that it happened at the exact same time as Anakin learning the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise. The dream was eerie, in a similar way to the first one, but brooding like the second one. This time there was no suit. It was just Anakin. Surrounding him were the discombobulated bodies of those he was friends with and served with. Anakin was facing away from her when the dream started. She could tell it was him, and she was very happy. He had this poise, the kind of poise that you knew it was Anakin Skywalker, but then she saw his lightsaber swing about in his hand. Her eyes moved from the back of his head to the ground and she saw right beneath his boots a number of bodies. Not just any bodies, but younglings. The children were strewn about as if they were trash, not even worth the time of day to even notice. The horror in her heart only continued. Her eyes moved from the younglings down to her own feet, where Ahsoka lay, her eyes still open but soulless, and Obi-Wan, he was cut down, next to him was Captain Rex, and a number of other people close to Anakin. As Padme moved her eyes back up towards Anakin, he told the people in front of him that he would do anything to make it right. Mace Windu, Yoda, and Plo Koon were all cut down simultaneously. She couldn't believe it. Anakin turned with a glare in his eyes. Yellow filled them, and he looked back at Padme, and she almost fell from her feet. She felt incredible pain shoot through her body, and the actions of Anakin caused so much fear for her that she had a miscarriage. The moment the wave of realization washed over her, she shot up from her sleep. Tears streamed down her eyes, and she leaned against the backboard of the bed. She looked around and felt her stomach. Everything seemed alright. This was too much. What was happening? Why was she having these dreams? What was Anakin doing or what did he do that caused these? Was it Anakin or was it fear? She couldn't stop these thoughts. All she could do was try to understand, try to make sense of it all, and yet she couldn't. All she felt was terror and for a good reason. It wasn't more than a couple minutes after she woke up that Anakin returned home. He didn't know she was still up but made his way to the bedroom to make sure she was still there. And when he walked in, she was almost inconsolable. She couldn't manage to get the words from her mouth and she felt so scared. What she saw was a clear indication that her greatest fear could seemingly become reality. Once she calmed down, she told Anakin about the dream, and a blast of chills and heat rolled out his skin. His body trembled and it felt like there were worms crawling up and down the interior of his skin. The itch was incurable for the first time maybe ever in his life he felt true fear for what he could become. He never had to look in the mirror and see how far it could truly go and now he did. This wasn't the war of the Jedi, Palpatine, Windu, Yoda, or Obi-Wan, it was him. Every dream pointed in that direction, in the same direction that if he carried down his path, then he would become absent from himself, subjugating not just those he cared about to a life of pain and suffering, but also himself. Could he legitimately live with that? Anakin now had an issue. Who should he confront on this? Obi-Wan and Yoda were gone. They had to pick up their piece of the war, so who could Anakin trust, if anyone at all? Palpatine couldn't use a force and he wasn't a Jedi, so he wouldn't necessarily have the words to explain away all these feelings that he had. All Anakin could do in the moment is comfort his wife and promise her that everything she saw and feared wouldn't become reality. He promised over and over again that he would do everything within his power to control himself to avoid doing anything that could lead to such an outcome. This nearly had Anakin staying home the following day, but he was requested to the temple once they learned that Kenobi had engaged General Grievous, which had Anakin going from the temple to the Republic Executive Building, where he encountered Palpatine. The Chancellor was hopefully optimistic that Obi-Wan would be up to the challenge. 
Palpatine could sense that Anakin was off balance, and he assumed that his plan was working, especially with a little touch of Darth Plagueis the Wise. He pushed Anakin a little further and informed him of being the Sith Lord, essentially. Anakin initially ignited his weapon, but thought of the nightmares Padme had, and left in a rush to inform the High Council, which was Mace, Fisto, Tin, and Kolar. Their orders wanted Skywalker in the Council Chambers until they returned. Anakin listened, and once their gunship was out of the hangar bay, he left for Padme's residence. She was there currently, and he told her what he learned. Padme was very confused, but if it was true, then she needed to act quickly. Anakin asked what she meant, and she explained that if Palpatine was apparently the Sith Lord, or in simple terms, conspiracy with the Separatist, and the Jedi Council went to arrest him, then they needed to ensure that the Jedi were not seen as trying to take control over the Senate. Padme got up and told Anakin to come with her, if he wanted to protect his friends. Then they needed to do this and go to the Senate building. While they moved for the Senate building and Padme called upon an emergency session, a massive brawl was taking place inside the Republic Executive Building. Jedi Masters Mace Windu and Kit Fisto were the only two members of the High Council showing off against the Sith Lord. Their duel was initially going badly, but without any distractions in the form of Skywalker, both Jedi Masters were able to defeat Sidious and force him to surrender. Mace had no intention of killing him, believing that they prove his crimes against the galaxy to the Senate. It would have been a lot more difficult, however, with the aid of Padme it would make their process a lot easier. It was a tense situation inside the Senate building, and upon Padme's request, Anakin informed Windu and Fisto of what was happening inside the Senate. Padme was much more in favor of supporting the Jedi than she was Palpatine, and with a delegation of 2,000 backing her, then she could make a fair point to the Senate before they could address the Jedi's actions. So as Padme was addressing the Senate in a makeshift speech she pulled together at the last second, she bought enough time for the Jedi to bring Palpatine to the Senate building to make their case. When they brought Palpatine in cuffs, the Senate was very confused, but a good number of senators were outraged. The Jedi knew that this would be a very hard case to present, and so on the way over, Fistu and Windu spent their time trying to figure out how to explain how Palpatine was a Sith Lord and how they came to such possible conclusion, something that was very obvious, but entirely possibly true. As the Jedi introduced the Sith Lord, Sidious, they explained it in a way that all the people could understand. The general public didn't know anything about the Sith, so they couldn't run on the fact that Palpatine was a part of an evil ancient religion. They needed to say something that would resonate with the Senate, and so this is what they said. They came off the back end of a great speech laid out by Padme, about how corruption had flourished since the Clone Wars started, and Palpatine's ascension during the Clone Wars has only ruined the ability for the Republic to reach a place of peace. Mace Windu spoke in front of the Senate and he told all of them, basically the same of what Padme said, and then he told the Senate that there was a correlation between the Sith, the Trade Federation, the invasion of Naboo, the vote of no confidence against Chancellor Valorum, and the rise of Palpatine's power. It was too planned to be coincidental, and so he connected them, suggesting that Palpatine was behind the Trade Federation's invasion of Naboo and the multiple assassination attempts on Padme over the years. To clarify, Mace wasn't even sure if this was true. His main gist was that he was hoping it was right. He was just speaking confidently about something he was entirely unsure of, and he wasn't sure if it was true or not, suggesting that Palpatine wanted the invasion of Naboo to provide him the room to suggest a vote of no confidence against Valorum. With Valorum gone, the issue of Naboo was immediately resolved. All of a sudden, the Trade Federation blockade went from dozens of lucre hulks down to one. Coincidental? He continued with Padme's change from Queen to Senator, and how her rise to Senator directly challenged him because of its stance against his policies. To do what she did deserved nothing short of an assassination, which happened multiple times throughout the Clone Wars and before the war, and also the one time she was sent to the coordinates of the burning of malevolence at the beginning of the war. When you continued and told the Senate that Palpatine went as far as to intermingle in Jedi affairs, it was laid out right in front of them everything they needed to know. The Senate was left in discussion for hours. Palpatine looked for an escape plan, but after Windu laid everything out, Anakin had to be refrained from slicing and dicing Palpatine. Anakin not for a moment considered the fact that Palpatine could have been behind the attempted assassination attempts on his wife. A number of Jedi were removed from the Order to create a protective layer around Palpatine. During the Senate hearings, Windu sent Anakin back to the temple to collect Ahsoka and Maul, as they had just returned from Mandalore. Anakin was willing to comply, and when he returned to the temple, he had a great amount of joy for seeing that Ahsoka was alright. She told him everything Maul had said, and the words started to connect, as if Ahsoka and Padme were speaking the same language. It was really bizarre, but alas, Maul was captured and so was Palpatine. Speaking of Palpatine, the Republic would dig a little deeper, and it would take a number of days to figure out the truth, which would have him immediately executed. The Jedi took Maul out of the sarcophagus and put cities into it for the time being while the hearings were going on. He was too dangerous to be trusted with anything else. 
Mo is sedated and put into a carbon freezing chamber and locked away in a vault under the Jedi Temple, with the multitude of other artifacts the Jedi found related to the Sith. The Separatists would be hidden on Mustafar for a number of weeks, until the Republic fleet stationed in the Outer Rim stumbled upon them after searching for them. During this time, Padme would give birth, and unlike Anakin's dreams, she would have a healthy birth and it would all go happily. For Anakin, it was a vital lesson about life for him, allowing him to let go of things he didn't have control over. With their twins, Luke and Leia, they would return to Padme's residence on Coruscant. Padme talked about her feelings towards restructuring the Republic before moving back to Naboo to raise the children and Anakin agreed. He'd remain on the High Council and be promoted to the rank of Jedi Master for assisting the Jedi in the downfall and capture of the Sith. Anakin's actions garnered the trash of the Council, and they were grateful for his ability to show maturity and stability in one of his most challenging times. It was all the more proof that he was worthy of the title. Anakin, for the most part, would stay on Coruscant during the preceding years. Ahsoka, having not rejoined the Jedi again, would be offered a place to stay at Padme's residence, which she almost declined so that she could join her friends, the Cortez sisters, in the Undercity. However, when she learned of the twins, she thought she might as well join Anakin and Padme. Anakin and Padme talked about it and decided that they officially adopt Ahsoka as one of their own, considering she was still considered a kid in the eyes of the Republic, being 17 and all. Ahsoka appreciated it and she was eternally grateful for the love that her friends showed her, especially in a means to his sister. Anakin wondered why they didn't do that earlier, but whatever. After the Republic became structurally sound, Anakin would step down from the Jedi Council and formally become a member of the Lost 21. He would join his family as they relocated to Naboo where Luke and Leia were joined by their older sister, Ahsoka. By adopting Ahsoka, Padme and Anakin didn't treat her any differently than they did already. She was just included in everything they did if she wanted. Ahsoka would come and go whenever she wanted, and she would further her own growth in the Force with Anakin as he began to instruct Luke and Leia in the ways of the Force. A couple years after the Clone Wars, a Pa'un Temple Guard would break Eris Ophi free from prison in a means to restart a new Sith Order but they would be thwarted by Kid Fisto and Obi-Wan Kenobi. After Anakin left the Order, Obi-Wan would come and visit the family from time to time. Luke and Leia were incredible kids, and they were a reflection of their parents. Both of them would, once they grew up, pursue a life in politics, like their mother. The two of them replacing Jar Jar in Naboo's Senate, and both of them trying for position at the top of the Republic. But that would take time. With the darkness vanishing from the galaxy and the Jedi returning to the role of knights, the galaxy began to heal in an era after the Clone Wars. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Diddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Flynn Vassis, Mad Manny Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, the man with three first names, Dark Saint 46, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Let's talk about our story. So this was kind of fun. Uh, I got a couple other stories involving dreams and visions coming up soon, but um, this was fun to do with Padme kind of taking the reins as the main character. I really need to put like mirroring and foreshadowing into this, and that's what I was really trying to do. Like Vader inside of the, the tomb, that's taken from I believe the comics or like a fan animation. The scene inside of the, the city streets, that's like Mapuzo during the Kenobi show. And then finally the last one is uh i think that's also a comic where anakin like well vader becomes like anakin and he's like super god kind of thing and he just destroys everything that's kind of what that was a reflection of but for the most part i really wanted to follow padme's journey on this i wanted to convey her fear as best as possible and make her fear feel realistic and we don't usually work with padme as a main character in these stories so i really i really worked hard to make sure that she felt the main character you know she she's the title character in the story and I wanted to make sure that like everything that she was feeling was conveyed as naturally as it could be to Anakin. I'm very firm in believing that they have a very toxic relationship, like seriously, they just don't communicate at all. And if you've ever been in a long distance relationship, if you don't have communication, just don't work. And so they don't work because they don't have good communication skills. And I wanted to convey that point. If they actually learn how to communicate with each other and be vulnerable with each other, they could probably save the galaxy from 20 years of Darth Vader. So anyways, hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.